Testing on YouTube. Testing on YouTube. All right, it seems to work on YouTube. I'm starting to think that Rumple Stilchin, this first guy, the first person to comment always has a crazy ass name and it's a different name every time. So I think this is the same guy and he keeps changing his name every time. I got you figured out, Rumple. How's it going, Majetti, the Yivian, Isaac? Hope you guys are ready. This one's going to be good. Alright, I think it should start here on X momentarily and then we'll get started. Alright, it's live on X. Let's announce the stream. All right, welcome everybody to another Hoopo stream. Today we're gonna go be uh, going into the robotics world. We got a paper for you guys. It's called Humanoid Locomotion as Next Token Prediction. Uh, this is a paper that's coming out of University of California, Berkeley. So that's basically right by San Francisco. It's on the other side of the bay, but kind of part of the Bay Area, for those of you that may not know. And this is not uh, the Ilya that works at OpenAI. This is a different Ilya. This is just some random undergrad at Berkeley. But yeah, that's uh, the paper. Uh, question from Cigar. What do you do in day-to-day -day life, studying or working? I'm secretly an alien. I've come here to teach you guys... AI so that you can create AGI and you can subvert the uh, forces that are controlling you in the government. So that's what I do. Okay. So let's get started. Let's just go through the abstract. There's a couple sentences here in the introduction that I think are worth reading and then we'll kind of go into that. Uh, okay. So in this paper, they're going to be casting real world humanoid control as a next token prediction problem, which is kind of what you're doing in a language model, right? The language model auto-regressively predicts one token at a time. Auto-regressively, as in it's looking at kind of all the tokens that have already happened, and then it's going to predict the next one. And predicting is basically a kind of a classification problem where you're picking a token out of a vocabulary of possible tokens, and the vocabulary is going to change. Even within language, there's lots of different uh, tokenizations, different vocabularies here, they're going to have a specific vocabulary that's for robotics. So our model is a causal transformer trained via autoregressive prediction on sensory motor trajectories. A trajectory is just a fancy way of saying a sequence, and sensory motor is just a fancy way of saying a sequence of data where that data is basically the measurements from sensors, specifically things like joint encoders or torque sensors at the joints or joint positions or whatever you want and then the motor might have things like a current or a torque basically telling you how much is how much force is being applied at that joint uh the general formulation allows us to leverage data with missing modalities like video trajectories without action so this is an interesting paper because it's actually very similar to the one we looked at yesterday but it's different in a bunch of different ways so uh in yesterday's paper which was the Genie Stream. I have it pulled up here as well. Uh, they also were uh, excited about basically using trajectories, or not trajectories in this case, uh, videos where you don't have actions, right? In this case, they were trained this on videos of 2D platformer games where they don't actually have the buttons that people clicked. So in a similar situation here, they're gonna figure out how to train a transformer on a bunch of robotics data that doesn't have the actions. So they're going to be going for kind of a scale approach here where they're going to be using all kinds of data such as simulated trajectories coming from prior neural network policies, model-based controllers, motion capture data, and YouTube videos of humans. So finally we're training on YouTube data for robotics. Uh, we're going to show that our model 
enables a full-size humanoid to walk in San Francisco, zero shot, which means that they train this transformer inside simulation on YouTube videos, motion capture data, and then they just deploy it, put it in inference mode on a robot, and the robot can actually walk, which is quite impressive. Our model can transfer to the real world even when trained on only 27 hours of walking data, which really isn't a lot, right? Compare uh, yesterday, this paper here, the Genie paper, uh, we were talking about 50,000 hours or something like that, like 55 million 16 second video clips, right? So 27 hours of walking data is basically nothing compared to some of the data set sizes that we see for these types of problems. Uh, finally here, it generalizes to commands not seen during training like walking backwards. So it's able to transfer learn into new domains. Okay. Here in the introduction, humanoid control as a data modeling problem uh, of large collections of sensory motor trajectories. The nature of data in robotics is different. So robotics means usually high dimensional and containing multiple input modalities, right? Usually we're used to thinking about modalities as text versus images versus audio, but uh, joint positions is a modality. Joint torques is a different modality. Uh, sixth off position is a modality, right? There's a lot of different weird niche modalities in robotics, and oftentimes you kind of have to deal with all of them, right? So it's kind of like a multimodal problem where the modalities aren't something that are that is easily found on the internet. Uh, different modalities include sensors like joint encoders. A joint encoder will, will tell you the angle of a joint, right? So you have a little joint encoder, it'll tell you 90 degrees, 20 degrees, 180 degrees. They're pretty accurate, but they're not perfect, right? So like anything else in the real world, there's going to be some noise in that, and that's what makes that kind of difficult. There's a lot of noise in the modalities of robotics, right? Compared to language, there's almost no noise, right? Because there's 27 letters. It's a very discrete, you know, unless there's like typos or something, you're largely getting the same tokens every time, or whether you're reading Shakespeare or you're reading a math textbook, it's the same letters, right? The same words. But in robotics, the the noise is a, a big deal here. Inertial measurements units, this is what gives you basically the inertial part is coming from the fact that these IMUs, as they're called, IMU for inertial measurement unit, uh, measure the acceleration. And then from that, they can give you things like velocity and orientation. You actually have one of these in your phone. It's how your phone knows what angle it's put at. But you can buy... Uh, more expensive, fancy ones that have uh, better accuracy and precision. Okay, so in order to deal with this type of robotics data, they're going to have to tokenize the input trajectories, aka the sequence of these uh, joint encoders and motor commands, and train a causal transformer to model the predicted shifted tokens. Uh, importantly, they're going to be predicting complete input sequences, including both sensory and motor tokens. In other words, we are modeling the joint data distribution as opposed to the conditional action distribution. So kind of what they're trying to shit on here is they're trying to shit on reinforcement learning, reinforcement learning, which has been really popular in robotics for the past 10 years. And people thought that reinforcement learning was going to be the answer to robotics, especially once it became deep reinforcement learning, but it never quite got the performance that people wanted to. And this paper is kind of showcasing that, right? So this paper is all about uh, going beyond deep reinforcement learning. It's not necessarily new because people have been looking at this in other papers, such as the RT series uh, out of Google, those papers that we've been looking at, the robotic transformer papers. But uh, it's no longer this idea of having a conditional action distribution where you're basically trying to predict the next thing conditioned on an action, right? Where the action is... Uh, the joint commands here. Uh, this has several benefits. First, we are training the neural network to predict more bits of information and consequently acquire a richer model of the world. So uh, in the paper we read yesterday, we introduced this idea of a world model, right? A world model is a, in this case, it's a, a video uh, model that basically tries to predict the next token in a video given previous tokens in a video, right? And you can condition world models on an action, so you can have an action conditioned world model. But here, rather than uh, basically having a world model that just predicts the next thing, it 
predicts the entire uh, trajectory, which is a more dense information signal, which allows it to kind of learn more. Second, we can leverage noisy or imperfect trajectories that may contain suboptimal actions. This is where they're going to be able to learn from YouTube videos, which are going to be extremely noisy, because not only do you have the, the noise uh, just inherent to the human motion, but then you also have the noise of the fact that you don't in order to get that human motion, you're going to have to do some pose detection and then retarget that into the uh, humanoid uh, skeleton. So any kind of multi-stage pipeline like that is going to be very noisy and imperfect. Uh, and finally, the third benefit of this, we can generalize our framework to learning from trajectories with missing information, right? And the missing information there is going to be the actions, video trajectories without actions, which we saw yesterday as well, right? Where in yesterday's paper they did not have these actions. They did not have what the user was actually clicking. They just had a video of someone playing a video game, but you have no idea what the user was controlling with, right? And same thing here, they're gonna have mocap data of a robot, but they don't actually even know what the commands were for that robot or what those actions were. Okay. Uh, they're gonna be replacing the missing tokens with learnable mass tokens. So kind of like a masked uh, prediction kind of task, which is kind of an interesting way to deal with that human videos from the internet, which we saw. And here's their kind of big figure. So the first figure in a paper generally kind of trying to be the most impressive here. They have the uh, digit humanoid robot walking around San Francisco. And here's the, uh, here's the real thing. You know what impressed me most about this is how clean San Francisco looks in this. <laughs> Some of you who live in the Bay Area might understand what I'm talking about, but I lived in San Francisco kind of all over the place when I lived there I think maybe six years, seven years, something like that. I moved pretty much every single year. So I lived all over the place. I've lived in all the different neighborhoods and I've even lived in the downtown area like Soma and it's it's a gross city. It's nasty. It's covered in homeless people. There's like poo everywhere, especially this area here. This is like down by the downtown city hall area. This, you, you can't even walk around here without like stepping on heroin needles. So the fact that they got this shot of the downtown area that looks empty and, and all these shots here look how clean san francisco looks it's i don't know kind of joking there but this is i don't know how they got where, when they did this they must have like woken up at some really weird time or maybe they did this right whenever they cleaned up the city i think there were some like government officials that were going to come in from china and then they cleaned up a lot of these places but this is not what san francisco really looks like <laughs> How's it going? KP, Aries, Majetti. Yeah, it's, it's very dystopian and depressing. <laughs> okay. Uh, to validate our method, they're going to apply it on the challenging task of real-world humanoid locomotion. We use the full-size digit humanoid robot developed by Agility Robotics. Okay. So what is this digit humanoid robot? So this is the robot. This robot is created by Agility Robotics. This is a a startup but now it's a it's a big startup you know it's kind of a, a more full-fledged company they got this little humanoid you know they have it doing all kinds of things these videos have really impressed me i've seen videos of these uh kind of walking delivering you know it does look like a robot that does get used and kind of the interesting thing that you've probably noticed is the legs on this right so the digit humanoid doesn't have uh knees that bend forward like a human does and the reason for that is that this design for the legs is actually more efficient and it's a little bit easier in terms of a control problem and it's not like a completely unique thing so actually the back leg of cats and a lot of uh, other animals have these kind of legs as well so you see how the way that cats kind of stand they have that same kind of outward bend that this robot does too and it, it's kind of become a little bit of a brand for agility robotics agility robotics started with these these were the cassie robots that they made i think this is how they got their seed and their early money that they raised but it, here they had the same kind of like uh i don't know what, what we can call this the chicken leg design i'm sure there's like a more formal name for that but this uh backwards knee is kind of what they're known for so that's a easy way to tell if it's an agility robotics robot so while we're at it, I figured we might as well look at some of the other humanoids that are out there. So here I have uh, the famous Boston Dynamics, which uh, actually isn't that great of a company, to be honest. Uh, pretty much what they do is they do demos. So they have these robots here, but these robots are 
they're very impressive, but they're basically just demo machines, right? You can't do anything with these robots. Like it, they just have like two of them and they're in-house and they're never going to let you do anything with these robots. And they're very, very expensive versus this robot here has kind of been designed for mass manufacturing, right? This is a robot that's intended to be kind of cheap, intended to be uh, manufactured cheaply and easily and quickly and kind of do a lot of different things versus this robot has is not designed under that. This was designed before we had this kind of AI revolution, so this is more intended to be used for research purposes. I'm pretty sure that Boston Dynamics is designing some kind of more mass manufacturer humanoid. I'm sure they're doing that right now just because of all the competition, but uh, it's not going to necessarily look like this one. This is definitely just a research platform. Here's another humanoid. This one's been kind of making the rounds. This is from a Chinese company, uh, and this is called the Unitree, I think, H3 or something like that, or H1. Yeah, there you go. And this one you can you can even buy, right? So that's another thing uh, in these robotics websites. So, for example, here in the Agility Robotics, you can't buy anything, right? You can go to home, robots, they can tell you about the robot, but there's really, there's no link to buy these, right? If you go on the Boston Dynamics, you can go into products and you can go to Spot. You can buy their dog, so... I don't know exactly where the link is here, but spot, uh, explore all products. But I've seen links. You can buy one of these. They're basically like 70 grand. But here's the first kind of like big humanoid that you can just literally buy from on the internet. You can buy it with PayPal. So this one's, you know, it looks okay. It looks a little bit more sketchy. You know, it doesn't even have hands. It just has these little stubs. The, the design seems pretty okay, you know, it doesn't seem particularly intense or particularly expensive like the Atlas, but uh, I think these guys also known for, the, they also have a, one of these quadrupeds as well, and they also have a arm, so it's the Chinese robotic humanoid, and here I have the figure one, so you guys probably have heard about this one, so this is the company that OpenAI decided to partner with, you know, and some people are kind of speculating that this is where the whole like Elon drama comes from, where Elon wanted them to partner with Tesla. They ended up partnering with this one. These guys raised a huge amount of money. Uh, but I'm just going to be honest with you. The robot is not impressive. Look at that. You see that? That's called a tether. And there's other things about this robot that just tell me that this is more of a research platform and not like a mass market humanoid, right? So first thing that immediately pops out to me is the amount of machined aluminum on this. So what I mean is this. So machined aluminum looks like this. And this is when you take a big block of aluminum and you, uh, or aluminum, I guess, if, if you guys are British, and then you have a machine with a little bit that just basically creates the shape using... You guys are familiar with additive manufacturing. That's where you add stuff, right? So like a 3D printer would be additive manufacturing. This is subtractive manufacturing, right? Where you remove material to make the part, right? But the problem with these machined aluminum things is that they're very expensive, right? This is really only done for very low volume, uh, expensive pieces, right? So whenever you have a robot like this that's entirely made, out of this type of part and all the cables are exposed, that's just telling me that you've never actually really done anything with this robot, right? The only thing you've done with this robot is you've kind of demoed it around inside your your company headquarters, but you've never actually deployed this and like had it run for seven days straight, right? <laughs> so as much hype as there is for these guys, I just don't really understand what the hype is because they honestly have one of the shittier humanoids, definitely doesn't look as cheap and production ready as this one. And uh, I don't know what their business model is, right? They're, you, like they're, they're gonna have to be a hardware company if they're partnering with OpenAI because OpenAI is gonna do all the software. So I don't know. Uh, then we got the Tesla Optimus. This one's also kind of much cleaner design. You see no more exposed cables. You see a lot more kind of parts that are m more plastic, more, and plasticky kind of almost in a good way, right? Because like I said, you want you want a, a robot that looks like you could manufacture 10,000 of them, right? You don't want a robot that looks like it needs to be handcrafted by the, uh, the, the forge gods. This robot looks like he can crank out 10 million of them. And Tesla has such a good 
track record of producing huge amounts of electric vehicles and other things like that, that I think that the scale of manufacturing that they're going to be able to achieve and the fact that they have all the battery stuff, all the actuators are all in-house, all of that stuff is made in-house. I think this is probably going to be one of the front runners in the humanoid race. This is an interesting video to like kind of watch in general. So like if you actually pause through this video, there's several parts here where you can actually see, you see this guy here in the, in the back, he's got a VR headset on. So he's controlling some robots in the back there with the VR headset. You can see just how many different robots they have as they walk through the factory. You see like all the different robots that they have. So they look like they're making good progress. You know, I think these guys look, the Tesla Optimus looks a little bit more uh, advanced, a little bit more ready for manufacturing, a little bit more ready for production than this one. This one just looks like a research platform. They obviously just crafted this to get some money, but we'll see where they go from there. Uh, then we have this one. So this is Phoenix. Phoenix is a humanoid created by Sanctuary AI. Sanctuary AI is a company from Canada. So this is a Canadian humanoid. Uh, it also looks a little bit uh, a bit, a little bit like a research prototype, you know, it's a little bit more sleek. It doesn't have the exposed cables, but a lot of these parts look, uh, very custom made, very, very intense. You know, uh, this looks a little bit more 3d printed. So maybe some of it is already starting to be designed for mass manufacturing, but it still feels kind of researchy. It just looks like another version of the, uh, Atlas or another version of the figure robot, right? Which is robots that are intended to raise money and, be there for a demo, but not really a robot that you're going to be uh, operating in a warehouse for seven days straight. Uh, and then I guess this one, I just threw this one up there. Here's another Chinese robotics company. This one almost looks a little bit like Asimo. This one's called UB Tech. So that's the uh, different humanoid robots. If you guys know of any other ones, feel free to comment in the chat. Uh, but the one that they're going to be doing for this paper is going to be our good old little friend Digit. Okay, so Digit Humanoid developed by Agility Robotics. Okay, uh, so they're going to be training this humanoid with a transformer. The transformer is going to basically consume a bunch of different weird types of data. And the impressive thing about this paper is just how weird all the different types of data are, right? So they're using everything from YouTube videos of humans, motion capture of humans, and uh, a different type of controller, such as a model predictive control. And we're going to go into exactly what model predictive control is because it's an uh, uh, overload of the word model. You guys think of model with a different word, but uh, we'll go into that. Uh, and of course, the retargeting is going to have to happen in order to use uh, mocap mo or YouTube videos of humans doing stuff. Uh, they're going to perform an extensive study in simulation, right? All of this stuff is largely going to be done in simulation, and then they're going to be able to zero shot into the real world. So it's not necessarily new. A lot of robotics research happens in simulation just because it's a lot cheaper. And then uh, that step of taking it out into the real world and seeing if you can zero shot it, it's kind of difficult. And sometimes it doesn't work, right? Sometimes you do everything in simulation. You go, you try to test it on the real robot, and it does not work at all. So the fact that this one worked well on the real robot is impressive. Uh, blah, blah, blah. This is going to be an autoregressive policy. Policy is just a fancy way to describe the neural net that actually outputs the next action. So this comes from reinforcement learning where you have this idea of a policy or a critic, actor, uh, value function, right? So policy comes from the reinforcement learning world, but it's just a neural net. Just think of it that way. And it's comparable and I think better in many ways to state-of-the-art approaches that use reinforcement learning. And the last kind of thing here, they're going to show in this paper that this has favorable scaling properties, which basically means that they're going to try with a couple different sizes of transformers, a couple different sizes of data sets, and basically show you that if you make the data set bigger, if you make the model bigger, it's going to uh, learn more. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> uh oh, I see I might, I might have angered some people in the chat, some uh, figure Andes who... <laughs> OpenAI has a great PR team and people who hype things up. Uh, yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. They want to hype it up. I just think that this robot, it just does not look... This is a demo robot. Like, look at these knees. Look at the... Look at the... All of these... These are extremely expensive <laughs> machined parts. This one looks a little bit more clean, but 
this doesn't even i don't even think this is a human is this like a a, a, mum, a a dummy is this like a real robot or is this like a, a mannequin i don't know i haven't i've only seen this one do any kind of movement okay All right, let's go into the approach. I'm gonna take this hoodie off. You know, I kinda wanna look like a hacker, but it's getting kinda hot, and now I'm sweating. <laughs> Figure looks the closest to the real Terminator. Yeah, I would say that, maybe, but the design of the Terminator doesn't look like an actual battle robot, right? A, a robot that you would deploy for a military use case would probably have an, an exoskeleton, some kind of like outer shell. So you definitely wouldn't want something that's like this exposed with all these cables, right? Because then you could just one good sniper shot and you pin and you you snipe off one of these cables, it's dead, right? You would definitely want something that's more covered. Uh, okay, humanoid locomotion. So people have been doing humanoid locomotion for a very long time, right? People were doing humanoid locomotion before I was even alive. But these stable locomotion behaviors have been achieved through model-based control approaches and optimization-based methods further enable highly dynamic humanoid motion. So what is model-based control? Now, this is the second time they've mentioned this here. They call it model predictive control. But when they're saying model predictive control or model-based control, they're not talking about a machine learning model, right? Whenever I say the word model, you guys probably think of a neural net, right? Some PyTorch code and then a model weights saved in a file. But that's not the type of model they're talking about here. What they're talking about here is uh, this. So, actually this. So this is uh, a pendulum, which is a mass on a string. And then these are a bunch of equations that tell you the behavior of this pendulum, right? So you have, uh, for example, the acceleration in the joint here, or the angle of this pendulum, is a function of a bunch of different things, such as your gravitational constant, the mass of the weight, the uh, sine of the angle, the length of the pendulum, right? There's a bunch of different variables in here, and you can just go and use basically, or use Newton's equations of motions and all kind of the classical physics equations, and you've now created this set of equations, and that set of equations is the model, right? So whenever people talk about the very early days of robotics where you're doing model-based control, what they're talking about is control, or control of the, uh, controlling the robot, using a model of the robot where the model of the robot is basically things like this. It's just systems of equations that are based on Newton's classical physics laws, right? So actually most of the demos that you've seen for, for example, the Atlas robot use this type of control, right? And this is the way that people did things forever. And I actually have a little bit of a blast from the past here. So I have here this is my paper. <laughs> this is not a very good paper, I'll admit. This is a paper that I did way back in the day when I was uh, doing robotics at Carnegie Mellon, but this paper is a type of model-based control. So guided locomotion in 3D for snake robots based on contact force optimization. So in this paper, right, I had to make all this Jacobians. You have all these different reference frames for a different snake robot you're basically creating this system of equations and then you're solving this system of equations with some kind of optimization that is hopefully fast, right? And that's uh, model-based control, right? And that's how people have been controlling robotics forever, right? But kind of around 2013, 2014, basically right after I graduated, people started thinking about, okay, well, wait a second, we're starting to get this thing called deep learning, and we're starting to see this thing called uh, reinforcement learning work really well with deep learning, right? So reinforcement learning has also been around for a while, but people weren't really using it for robotics. People were using it for things like Blackgammon, right? Or a bunch of other kind of games. And then people at DeepMind started using uh, a version of reinforcement learning called deep reinforcement learning, where they use neural networks to approximate things like the policy and the critic, and it worked pretty well in Atari games. And then people were like, oh, wait a second. We could probably do this for robotics. So for the next 10 years, people tried to get deep reinforcement learning to work 
on robots, right? So we basically robotics moved from this type of model-based control or optimal control where you have a system of equations and you're solving this system of equations. And the problem with that is that those equations are never quite right, right? It's like you never, no matter what, you're never, like the mass isn't exactly perfect. The length isn't exactly perfect, right? Sometimes the pendulum is going to twist a little bit and the length will get a little smaller. Sometimes the there's a dent on one side of the of the ball so that it's not quite balanced, right? And if you think about now the um, system of equations that describes this robot here, it's even more wrong, right? Think about all the different tiny things that can be wrong. The model, the, the friction of the hands to the floor, the friction of the foot to the floor. So model-based control and optimal control, which is like the higher umbrella that encompasses model-based control, those techniques didn't quite work, which is why we didn't get robotics in 2000s and the 2010s. And then people tried reinforcement learning, and that's what people tried kind of in the second half of the 2010s and the beginning of the 2020s, didn't really quite work either. I think we got a little bit of advances. You saw things like end-to-end -end learning, a bunch of people in Berkeley, such as Sergey Levin, did this kind of end-to-end. -end. People thought that was going to be the answer, but it didn't quite work as well either. So now we're kind of on the third wave of robotics. And this third wave of robotics is not based on these physics equations like model-based control. It's not based on reinforcement learning, which was the old type of deep learning that people did. It's now based on basically transformers and what they're gonna be doing in this paper represents kind of the third wave of robotics, which is, hey, let's just hu use a huge amount of data and just mash that through a giant transformer and see what comes out the other end. So it's actually the simplest out of all of them, which is a little bit, which is kind of beautiful, right? When you think about it. So I would say the most complicated out of all of these is model-based control, right? Model-based control was an absolute mess of these fucking equations and like all these different things. And it was so complicated that deep reinforcement learning by comparison was actually way easier, but it didn't quite work. But out of all of these, uh, a giant transformer with a giant amount of data is the easiest out of all of them and it actually performs the best. So kind of the universe gifted us, uh, gifted us something here by basically making the uh, robotics problem easier over time. So rather than uh, the robotics problem getting harder, and in order to get that extra performance, we had to come up with more complexity. We actually made things much simpler, and now we're, it's working way better, which is very pleasing. Uh, <laughs> tight. Uh, Khalil, the last two papers now trained from YouTube videos. Is that the future of training? Yeah, I wouldn't say YouTube specifically, but any kind of video data training from that is kind of what you're going to want to do. Okay. Uh, so let's go into the approach. This is, this is not, so this is a paper that comes out of Berkeley. So this is an academic paper. Sometimes in academic papers, they kind of like explain things a little bit too simply, but uh, I do like this explanation of the uh, that they have here. So we're going to go through it, even if it's a little bit uh, verbose here. So they have a data set D of sensory motor trajectories T, right? Where your sensory motor trajectories T, uh, you see here it's a list of O and A's. O's are observations and A's are actions, right? So your observation is going to be the position of all the different joints in the robot, right? So for example, if we go here to the unitree robot, Right, we scroll down, there's going to be a spec sheet here, and then here you go, boom. It says degrees of freedom of each leg, uh, five. Degrees of freedom of each arm, four. Right. So if you were to say, add up all of these degrees of freedom, right, uh, and then imagine a vector that has one number for each of these degrees of freedom, that's going to largely be the observation space of the robot. Right. You're basically, it's all the different parts that you can measure and uh, by parts, I mean joints, right? But you're gonna have other things in there too, right? You're gonna have, for example, the IMU is gonna be an extra, this thing here, inertial measurement unit is gonna be an extra six numbers, which is kind of the yaw, the pitch and the roll, maybe even more than six numbers because you'll have kind of like uh, angular momentum, things like that, right? So the observation space of the robot is basically all the different, it's like a vector that contains all the information that you can get from all the different sensors of the robots, uh, except it's not pixel space, right? So this is it's not a camera, it's it's not a picture coming from any of the cameras or like a point cloud or anything like that. It's just the joints, the uh, uh, inertial measurement unit stuff, accelerometer, stuff like that. So it's just those type of numbers. 
Uh, they're going to tokenize this trajectory into K tokens to obtain a sequence of tokens T1 to TK. All right, so now we're going to have to figure out a way to go from a series of uh, sequence of uh, observations and actions all the way to OTAT and go to a sequence of tokens all the way to TK. So their goal is to train a neural net to model the density function autoregressively, right? So this density function here, you see how the P of TK is trying to get the density function, aka a distribution, that'll tell you what this next token is, TK, given, so that vertical bar there basically says, okay, this is what I want, and then everything on the other side of the vertical bar is what I'm get, getting, right? Or what I'm conditioning on, or what I'm receiving. So given TK minus one all the way to T1, which is like the previous, all the previous part of the sequence here, and then what you want is the density function for that last token. It, that's gonna allow you to then get the last token. So the way that they're gonna do this is they're gonna minimize the negative log likelihood over the trajectory data set, where the trajectory data set is gonna be this huge, huge mishmash of different data. And then if we keep scrolling down here, they're gonna assume a Gaussian distribution with a constant variance and train a neural network to minimize the mean squared error between the predicted and the ground truth tokens. And this is something a little bit interesting here, right? Where instead of regressing the raw token values, we could quantize each in each dimension into bins or perform vector quantization. However, we found a regression approach to work reasonably well in practice and opt for simplicity. So this is an interesting little detail here, right? So m usually what people do in these autoregressive uh, next token prediction is that they will basically quantize the the tokens right the the space in which these tokens live they'll use vector quantization to to basically dis discretize it and then once you discretize it you'll have a limited vocabulary of tokens and then you can basically turn this into a classification problem right so for example in yesterday's uh paper in yesterday's genie paper right the way that they are training this is the model is trained with a cross entropy loss between the predicted tokens and the ground truth tokens. So cross entropy loss, anytime you see that, you should think classification, right? So you're basically, every token is a classification problem where you're picking which token out of 100 possible tokens it is, right? So once you discretize the space of tokens, you turn it into a classification problem and you can train with a cross entropy loss. In this paper, they're actually gonna do a simpler version of that where they're literally just gonna minimize the mean squared error between the tokens, right? So th they're saying there's gonna be a ground truth token, which is analogous to the ground truth class, but rather than saying, here's a cross entropy loss of this token compared to all other possible tokens that it could have been, they're just gonna say, okay, well, this token is some vector of numbers, and the token that we wanted is this vector of numbers. We're just gonna take the difference between those right here, square it, right? So if the token is more off, then the error is gonna be big, the loss is going to be big, and over time, your loss is going to go down. So I thought this was kind of interesting here where they they went, they made it actually simpler than uh, most approaches, which are doing this cross-entropy loss, and it worked better. So that's kind of cool. Uh, okay, what else do we have here? I think there's one extra thing. No, let me keep going. Okay. So, so far, they've assumed that each trajectory is a sequence of observations and actions. However... Sometimes you're going to have missing modalities, right? You're going to have trajectories that, for example, are extracted from videos, and so they don't have actions, right? They don't have the action that the human was actually taking because that there's not even the notion of that, right? You just have a bunch of position data for the human. So suppose we have a trajectory of observations without the actions. So now you have a trajectory here, a sequence of observations from O1 to OT. Our key insight is that we can treat a trajectory without actions like a regular trajectory with the actions masked. Namely, we can insert a mask token to obtain now a trajectory that is exactly what you want here, right? Observation, action, observation, action, observation, action, except you don't know what the actions are, so you're just going to replace this with mask tokens. Observation, mask token, observation, mask token, observation, T, mask token. So basically what they're doing is they're going to say, okay, we have a big data set. Some of this data set doesn't have actions. So what are we going to do? In the paper yesterday, the way that they solve this is that they create this latent action model. So they train a model that basically discovers an action space. So in yesterday's Genie paper, they discover actions by doing this uh, vector quantized VAE encoder, decoder, they f you feed enough data into that, eventually this action space kind of magically emerges, right? 
it was a little bit of cheating because in this paper they do uh, entirely using a 2D platformer, so the action space is kind of obvious, right? It's just up, down, left, right, jump. So like it, because it's such an obvious action space, it kind of makes sense that you can kind of just get the action space via this uh, encoder decoder uh, VAE kind of uh, training process. So that's how they do it in this paper. They basically create this latent action model to get an action space from the observation so they can feed in an observation and then get the action. In this paper, they don't do that. They basically say, okay, well, let's just pretend that we're doing some kind of masked training problem and then we just don't know what that action is. So we're just going to sub in this mask token. Okay. Uh, for each input token, we predict the next token of the same modality. Uh, they train jointly with all the data at once, including complete and incomplete trajectories. Alternatively, we can first pre-train on noisy and incomplete trajectories, but both approaches work comparably, which is kind of interesting. They tried a little bit of a curriculum approach here where they were like, okay, what if we train on the trajectories that do have actions and then maybe fine tune or train on everything and then fine tune only on the ones that have uh, actions, which you're seeing more and more, right? A lot of kind of modern uh, AI is going into this uh, exploring the space of kind of curriculums where you have multiple uh, training stages and the data for each training stage is different. So you have the pre-training stage, you have the instruction tuning stage, maybe you have fine tuning stages after that. Maybe you even have multiple uh, pre-training stages with different mixes of data. So this Curriculum stuff is getting pretty complicated, but actually here they have no curriculum. So they, they were like, hey, we, we tried to do kind of a, a two-part training, but it turned out that it didn't even matter. And you could just literally put all the data into just one giant bucket, just train it, and that's it. And it works. So I, that's kind of why I like this paper. It's just it's very, it's very, very simple, but they get very, very good results. And I love to see that because most of the time when we read papers, what ends up happening is that someone takes something that worked, they add a little bit of complexity and it works a little bit better, right? And then someone takes that paper, adds a little bit more complexity and it works a little bit better. But then what happens with that is that five years down the road, you, you're reading a paper and there's like seven different parts to it, right? There's like this like 500 IQ training pipeline and regularizations and all these different little pieces that plug in. And that kind of sucks, right? Because it's the more complicated something is, the more difficult it is to reproduce, the more difficult it is to understand, and it's just not great for science and engineering progress. So these type of papers where they basically remove all the complexity, go back to the simplest possible version of things, and it works even better, I think it just, uh, it's a beautiful situation. Okay. And so here in this figure, they're just showing you the data, the training, the deployment. So your data is going to, you're going to have some coming from a neural network. Well, actually, we're going to go into this data. I think that's the next thing they talk about. But the transformer here, right, you have a standard sequence to sequence model. So the transformer consumes a sequence of things and then outputs a sequence of things. So in this case, the sequence of things that they're going to be consuming are these uh, trajectories of observations and actions. So how are they going to take this trajectory of observation and actions and turn it into a, a trajectory or a sequence of tokens, right? So they have to go from this OA, O1, A1, O2, A2 into T1, T2, T3, right? So how are they going to tokenize this? So uh, let's see. Our model is a vanilla transformer. Perfect. You know, I love to see that. You know, like yesterday's paper, they used this 500 IQ ST transformer from like some paper that no one's ever heard of. And I was just like, why? You know, just more complexity. But here they're like, nope, it's just a vanilla transformer. <laughs> okay, they're going to tokenize the trajectories uh, by separating linear projection layers for each modality but shared across time. To encode the temporal information, we use positional embeddings. So positional embeddings to let the transformer know uh, where in the sequence you are or where in the trajectory you are. And in order to combine the observation I and the action I, so here you see how OI, the dimensionality of the observation space is R to the M. So there's, it's a little vector where M is the total number of numbers in that vector for the observation. And the action space is of dimensionality RN, right? So the N is the number of numbers in the action vector, right? So in order to turn that into a token, they're literally just going to concatenate it. 
which is pretty clean, and that's what pretty much everybody does, right? So you, you take your observation vector, which maybe there's 20 numbers in that, then you take your action vector, maybe there's 10 numbers in that, and then you just put them like that, you just concatenate them. And this is actually different from what we saw yesterday. So yesterday, we saw a similar situation. So here they have the Z is kind of the equivalent of the observation, except in this case, it's a video token. And then here, the action token, which is kind of equivalent to the action. So you have the same kind of observation action. But in yesterday's paper, they do this additive embeddings, right? So they actually kind of do this crazy shit where because the action space is 32 dimensional and because the uh, observation space is also 32 dimensional they can literally add those together and that was a weird thing that they did here right so a common practice for training world models is to concatenate the action to the corresponding frame which is exactly what they're doing here they're just concatenating the observation and the action but in yesterday's paper they actually add them together which was kind of weird but in this paper they didn't think of that and also, it's not even the same dimensionality, right? So the M and the N are different dimensions here, which means you can't uh, add them together. But it could be something to explore. You know, if you uh, if you guys are interested in this space and looking uh, about what you can do in terms of research projects, you can try that, right? Maybe it'll lead to some performance improvements. Okay, but then once you have this token, then you uh, have this feed forward weight linear projection layer, just a fancy way of saying basically a bunch of little neurons described by a matrix of weights, W, right here, right? The dimensionality of that weight matrix is D by M plus N, so that whenever you do the matrix math multiply, right, you end up getting a D-dimensional embedding vector that represents that. So that's how you take your observations and your actions and turn it into these tokens. So, okay, now you have a sequence of tokens, perfect. So you can feed that into your transformer, which is a vanilla transformer. Uh, when an action is unavailable, we use the mass token, which we saw before. It's initialized as a random vector and learned end-to-end -end with a hold model. So the mass token, they actually push gradients into this. So eventually the mass token has some value. They don't, they're not going to necessarily do anything with that mass token. So I don't know if that matters much, but I guess if you're curious. The model takes the sequence of embedding vectors, H0. So now you've gone from your obser sequence of observations and actions to a sequence of tokens. You've multiplied it by this uh, weight matrix here or a linear projection layer. Now you have a sequence of embedding vectors, H1, 0, H2, 0, HT, 0, right? Up until T. Transformer architecture contains L layers, each consisting of a multi-head self-attention module and an MLP module. Let's just transformers, attention, image just pull this up here's your multi-head attention here's your feed forward or your mlp right so that's what they're describing there they're basically saying a multi-head self-attention and an mlp module so multi-head self-attention and then an mlp module or feed forward okay uh the output is composed as follows so they feed the output hl this embedding they go through a layer norm then they go through the multi-head self-attention you see this uh, how they're adding here. That's the recurrent connection. So if we actually go to the transformer, you see how there's this little arrow that goes uh, around. Actually, let's get a better one. Let's do this one. Yeah, and also the, the normalizations are also generally before now. So in the original transformer paper, this normalization is after. You see that? But now usually they put it ahead. So here the normalization happens before the multi-head uh, self-attention. But now it uh, in this figure, it's after but your uh, residual connection here, so that little arrow that wraps around, that's what this plus is here, right? So those are your residual connections, and then the last part is your MLP or your feed forward, this one right here, right? So if you guys are interested in mixture of experts, a mixture of experts, you would have an extra, basically a router here, and the router would pick different MLPs depending on the uh, tokens that are coming in. The multi-head self-attention has a causal masking where the token only attends to itself in the past tokens. This is uh, pretty standard, right? This is why it's called a causal transformer. So here they mention uh, a causal transformer. That's because it has that masking. That masking just basic, uh, prevents the transformer from kind of cheating and looking ahead and trying to basically predict the next token based on the future. So they have this mask, right? 
Uh, we project the embedding to predicted states and actions with a linear projection layer. Okay, so now they go through multiple blocks of this transformer, but eventually they need to turn it back into this observation and action. So in order to turn it back into an observation and back into an action, they're going to have another linear projection layer. In this case, it's W hat, right? And you see how the dimensionality of this is opposite. So the other one up here, the dimensionality of this one was D by M plus N, where M is the dimensionality of the observation space and N is the dimensionality of the action space. So that projects you into this D-dimensional embedding space, right? But now if you want to go back to the observation and the action space, now you have to do the opposite. So now you see how the dimensionality of this is M plus N by D. So now that'll basically uh, undo that and you'll end up with your observation and your action. Uh, well, what you'll actually end up with is some vector t, which represents this token, and then the first m elements of that vector are going to be your observation, and then the next m or n elements of that vector are going to be your action. So they basically unconcatenate. And that's basically it. You know, it's a very, very simple model architecture, very, very simple approach. There's nothing tricky in here, no fancy spatio-temporal, like, crap, like, none of that. It's just a standard transformer with a linear projection layer to put uh, this observation in action and they just concatenate the observation in action. So kind of like the simplest possible version of this, which makes me very happy. Uh, question from Emily. If this can be done with robots and joint angles, why not do it with dihedral angles in proteins? Probably, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know much about uh, protein folding, but you could definitely do that, right? The observation space of a robot is basically a vector of a bunch of numbers that represent that robot, where those numbers are joint angles, joint velocities, things like that. So if you were trying to do some kind of autoregressive way of predicting protein folding, right? Maybe your observation space could be the angles between the proteins. I don't, I don't know if exactly, or the angles between the amino acids in the protein or like, I don't know, something like that, right? Generally, when you're trying to solve a new problem with machine learning, the first, or some kind of control problem like this, the first thing you really want to think of is what is my observation space and what is my action space? So that's, that's what I would uh, recommend is like, uh, think about what is my observation space? Do I want to do stuff in pure pixel space? So 87 answers or 87 asked observation is visual pixel data. This is not visual pixel data. This is joint data, right? So there's no, there's no, it's not doing, it's not using the camera in any way. There's no, uh, vision information here. This is doing it purely in the observation space of the robot, which in this case is basically the position of all the joints. Okay. It's all good. I'm, I make terrible questions myself all the time. All right. At inference time, our transformer model will always have access to observation action pairs. In this setting, we'll apply our transformer model autoregressively for each observation action pair token. So what the transformer is uh, basically predicting is these observations and actions together, right? So you see how I think here the dark parts are supposed to represent the actions and then the light things are supposed to represent the observations. So what your transformer is predicting is basically observation, action, observation, action, observation, action, observation, action. Uh, well, it's not even doing that. It's predicting tokens and then you're unconcatenating those into observation action. <laughs> okay. Uh, we then take the observations from the robot and discard the predicted observations. So obviously when you're going to be running this, uh, the transformer is going to tell you, okay, this is this is your current set of joint positions. This is the current actions that you've been taking. Uh, here's the next observation, and then here's the next action. So the next observation is actually kind of irrelevant, right? You don't need it because you're on a real robot. You can just measure that. But the what you're interested in is the next action. So you're going to take that action and then execute that action on the robot. But uh, the observation you're just going to kind of throw away. Right. So when you're actually using this for inference, you don't actually care about the observation that it gives you. Uh, data set. Okay. Now they're going to go into the actual data set. Right. Okay. So one of these types of, or one of the pieces of the data mixture, right? So whenever I say data mixture, I mean basically all the different types of data that you're using to train this, right? There's going to be different buckets of data. And the first bucket is going to come from neural network trajectories. 
So they're going to be training a neural network policy trained with large scale reinforcement learning. So specifically, this policy is trained with billions of samples from thousands of randomized environments in Isaac Jim. Isaac Jim is this. So Isaac Jim is a simulator, I think created by NVIDIA, where basically you take simulated robots and you have them do things in these simulated worlds. And what they mean here with uh, randomized environments is that usually uh, in these randomized environments, you're changing variables, right? So you're not going to use the same gravitational constant every time. You might have uh, a little bit less gravity, a little bit more gravity. You might change the amount of weight of the different links. So sometimes the left leg is really heavy. Sometimes the right leg is really heavy, right? Sometimes the robot's a little bit taller, a little bit shorter. So by changing a bunch of those different uh, properties of the simulation, you're going to able your, which is called uh, domain randomization, is you're going to get uh, a, a, a wider variety of data, right? So it's kind of like, think of it like data augmentation in uh, simulation space. So they're going to be scraping Isaac Jim from this. But the interesting thing is that the trajectories themselves are going to be coming from a uh, reinforcement learning policy, right? So think about a little neural network that's been trained with reinforcement learning, right? It's been conditioned on specific velocity commands or action conditioned, and then it produces the next action, right? So your policy is a neural network that consumes the, the state, consumes the observation, and then produces the action, right? This is what I'm going to do given this state. So for example, the policy in a game of chess, it consumes the state of the game, and then it gives you an action, which is the next move, right? So as I was saying before, this is actually kind of uh, a technique that failed, right? So people were doing deep reinforcement learning in robotics for almost a decade, and that's the most recent attempt, and it never really worked. So they're going to take a reinforcement learning uh, controller that was trained in this simulator and use that as a way to collect data, right? And those type of trajectories are going to be very unique because reinforcement learning uh, control policies have their own kind of like flavor. You know, they're kind of noisy in their own way. They're, they're kind of unique in their own way. So these neural network trajectories are going to be very different from the model-based trajectories, which are coming from this kind of more formal uh, model-based control where you have a system of equations that you're solving and you're trying to basically uh, produce the control uh, information that is optimal for whatever it is, walking forward or something like that, right? So you have two sources of their information or two, two of their data set sources are coming from the two previous generations of uh, robotic control. So like I said before, uh, model-based control was more like a 2010 or, or like uh, the 2000s, the 1990s, the 1980s, the 1970s. That's where all this model-based control stuff was. Reinforcement learning was more 2010s. So they're taking the previous ways of doing this control and then just using it as a way to get a bunch of data, specifically 10,000 trajectories of 10 seconds each on flat ground uh, and 10,000 trajectories of flat ground for also 10 seconds each. And it's interesting here that they make a little note. So they say model-based controller developed by Agility Robotics, deployed on the digit humanoid robot and available in the Agility Robotics simulator as well. So this is interesting because what it's telling you is that Agility Robotics, the company, has their own simulator, which isn't super unusual, right? Most robotics companies make their own simulators, but it's telling you that they are using model-based control. So, you know, as this is kind of like a Boston Dynamics type approach, right? And I think it's like the, the, the reality with model-based control is that it's much more explainable. So it's much more predictable and explainable because you know exactly what the inputs and the outputs, so you know exactly what the model is. The model is a set of equations, so it's much easier to kind of understand and you can know exactly what the robot's going to do, right? And model-based control works very well for uh, the Atlas robots and these other Boston Dynamics robots that they've been demoing for decades now, right? So it kind of makes sense that the people who are behind Agility Robotics, who are from that kind of older generation of robotics, decided to ship their product with a model-based controller. But that's already two generations behind, right? It's not even a reinforcement learning controller. And even a reinforcement learning controller would be outdated in 2024. In 2024, 
if you're really trying to push the state of the art of robotics, you got to be doing uh, kind of a transformer that's been trained on a huge amount of data. So it's a little bit sad to see that agility robotics is still using this kind of model based control and that's what they ship. So if uh, you're Berkeley and you buy this robot, it comes with a simulator and the control policies on that simulator are based on model based control. So not hype. Okay. We use the default model based configurations, randomize the leg length, step clearance, bounciness of the floor. So they're also doing a little bit of the domain randomization within this agility robotics simulator. Uh, this controller outputs joint torques, which are not consistent with our joint position action space. So here's another kind of tricky part, right? Is that uh, in their, the way that they're going to be training this uh, transformer, they're going to be training it on these observation action pairs, right? But the action space that they're training on is different depending on the data source, right? So for these ones here, the reinforcement learning policies, they can get the ac uh, actions. So they can get the observation and the actions. For the model-based trajectories, it's actually the action space is different, right? Because it's actually doing torque control rather than um, position control. There's different types of control, different action spaces. So it's not even the right action space. So the only thing that they're going to get out of this model-based control trajectories from the agility uh, simulator is basically a sequence of actions Right, so this model base, actually here we go, this is the picture I wanted. So the neural net controller, the reinforcement learning Isaac Sim, you're gonna get observations and action pairs. The model base controller, it's not the right action space, so you're only gonna be able to get uh, observations. And then uh, it's gonna be a similar situation for the mocap and the internet video, so let's go into that. Human motion capture trajectories. They're gonna use this kit data set, which is mocap recordings of humans. It's around 4,000 trajectories of things like walking, standing, running. Uh, and then the trajectories from the YouTube video, which are coming from the PHALP. It's probably some kind of pose detection, right? So you basically feed it an image or a video, and it gives you the pose, and then you feed it a sequence of images, and then it'll give you a sequence of poses. But the problem with both of these, so the human motion capture and the uh, YouTube videos, is that the human body is different, right? It's a different morphology. So... This is, uh, at the very beginning, they talked about this retargeting, right? So retargeting is whenever you take uh, an animation or a motion that's intended for one type of skeleton, and you have to figure out how to apply it to a different type of skeleton, right? So it's not fun. The way that people are doing this, or the way that they're doing this is with inverse kinematics. Inverse kinematics is... Uh, Kinematics is the problem of saying, okay, I have these lengths, these a kinematic chain. So this is a kinematic chain with two links. Uh, you can think of it like the arm of a robot. These arms have specific joints. And I know the position of these joints, right? So my joint encoders at this uh, position and at this position, they're telling me what these angles are, but I want to know the position of this end effector here. So forward kinematics would be to get, say, okay, I know what this joint is, I know what that joint is, I know what the length of these links are, and I can just basically solve these trig equations and get the final position of this, right? The position of the hand. Inverse kinematics is the opposite. Inverse kinematics is, okay, I want a specific position for the hand. How do I get the joint angles that would give me that position? And that's how you're going to retarget these animations, right? So basically they're gonna have a bunch of videos of humans, either via internet, where they're doing uh, this pose detection with this P, P help, or mocap, right? Those are gonna be different skeletons, but what you can say is, okay, well, I want the hand of the robot to be roughly in the same place as the hand of the human. I want the foot of the robot to be roughly in the same place as the foot of the human. So they're just gonna be solving this like an inverse kinematic problem and say, okay, if, I, if the foot of the robot is here, what is the joint angles that I need to get the foot in that place, right? And then you solve that over time. It's not going to be clean, right? The inverse kinematics is a optimization problem. It's not like you can get a final closed form solution out of it. You're going to basically try to approximate, optimize, get to something good using uh, here the system of equations because the tricky part is it's not even just inverse kinematic in a static situation. It's inverse kinematics with a uh, velocities, right? So the robot is in motion, the the human is in motion. So you don't just have the robot state Q, you also have the velocity, right? The human is moving with some velocity, the robot is moving with some velocity, you're trying to match that as well. So it's kind of a very noisy way of getting a trajectory 
in robot observation space, but it's fine, right? It's fine if it's noisy because you're kind of kind of hit this with a scale hammer, right? So even if you have uh, noisy data, if it's 10 times the amount of data, you're probably going to be able to squeeze a little bit more juice out of that. So uh, interesting situation. And I think that this is almost representative of the, of the four big types of data that you could train robots on, right? You can think of a uh, neural net controller. Actually, there's another one here. So neural net controller would be the reinforcement learning, which I said is the previous generation of robotic control. Model-based controller is like the grandpa generation of uh, robotic control, but also model-based controllers are really good because it's literally multiple decades of progress. So these are really good. And also they're based on these physics equations. So it's like really clean. Another type of thing that they could have put here is uh, behavior cloning or expert policy. So you can imagine like a human doing a teleop. I think it would be a little bit difficult here because you're doing legs. So it wouldn't be quite the same. But then mocap and internet videos, also another good source. And I think those five, like these four with the uh, expert or teleop represent, I think, the biggest categories of data for robotics. So it's really cool that you can just basically combine all of these, mash them into a vanilla transformer, and get state-of-the-art uh, control policy. Uh, we use the human joint positions to retarget the motion using the inverse kinematic optimization described above. I guess they also filter trajectories with low optimization costs. So this inverse kinematics is not going to be perfect, right? So if you run this inverse kinematics optimization and you end up with a solution where it's like, hey, we weren't, we really weren't able to match the position of the hands and the position of the legs and the position of the knees, throw it away, right? Uh, question from Sukun. Uh, do we need this, do we need trials to get training samples? Is it limitation in another field? Do you not have a simulator such as medical robots? You don't, yeah, so I mean, there is a little bit, your task matters, right? So a lot of times in these papers, like the, it looks great, but there's biases that are kind of implicit to the problem itself, right? So in yesterday's paper, I, I spent a lot of time kind of shitting on them because the reason that this worked was because the action space is so similar in all these 2D platformers, right? So almost every single 2D platformer has basically an identical action space. So it's easy to uh, use a latent action model to learn this action space. And the same kind of thing happens here, right? Where the reason uh, you can use all these different types of data is because the robot itself kind of looks like a humanoid, right? So you can look at a bunch of internet videos of people walking and get some signal from that data because your robot looks like a humanoid, right? These videos and this mocap would probably be way more useless if you were trying to do this on a quadruped or if you were trying to do this on another weird, like a spider robot, right? Like that would not work. So uh, to answer your question, Sukun, it's like something like a medical robot, which is like this weird, like, if you got, have you guys ever seen those, the Da Vinci robot? Yeah, like, you know, like you're not, you're not going to be, this is like a, a famous medical robot, but like you can't, look at videos of the internet of people playing basketball and like expect that that's going to transfer in any, in any reasonable way to this, right? This is such a unique morphology that it's going to be harder to find data that can help in that case, which is maybe in a way an argument for humanoid robotics, right? So uh, there's been people on the internet that are kind of saying, hey, why are we doing all this humanoid robotics crap, right? Like the human form factor isn't necessarily the best. Why don't we just have a bunch of specialized robots like this? Well, one of the arguments is that if you have a humanoid robot, you can train it on human data, such as internet video. So it becomes a much easier problem to transfer learn human on a video into a humanoid robot than it is to transfer learn surgery videos into this, right? That would be significantly harder. But uh, for a medical robot, you have different types of data. So you have this, right? So these medical robots, they're controlled by these dudes who sit there, like these dune navigators, right? You could just record that. So if you're a medical robotics company, get one of these surgeons who knows how to use this robot, pay them to sit in a room and just do this for 24 hours a day for like a month, and you're going to end up with basically a bunch of expert 
control policies. And you can then use this same approach on, but instead of training on these things, train on those expert policies. It'd be a little bit more kind of like behavior clony, but you got to get creative in uh, how you get your data if you got a weird robot. Question from Ruslan. Have you ever seen such mashed transformer models for controls? I don't know what you mean by mashed transformer model models. I've seen uh, transformers used to control robots. We've reviewed a couple papers like that. Uh, so the one that comes up to my head is the Google papers. So Google has an internal research group that does uh, uh, robotic transformers. They've released multiple papers now, RT1, RT2, RTX. Those guys, they're using a transformer-based model for robotic control, but it's its relatively new, right? I think if just five years ago, nobody was doing this, right? Everybody was doing deep reinforcement learning. And 10 years before that, nobody was doing reinforcement learning. Everybody was doing model-based control. And the field takes a while to change, right? So even right here, right, we learn that... Uh, the agility robotics, they don't even use a reinforcement learning based controller. They use a uh, model based controller. So it takes a while for things to kind of get used in production. So I think if agility robotics isn't even using, is still using model based control, like I think it's a while until we have transformer based robots as the default, even though I bet you that figure. Tesla Optimus, these guys, I, they're probably sniffing down this uh, particular branch for sure. Okay. Combining the four modalities, mocap and video. Yeah, there's similar things. So people have trained on things like internet videos and mocap, but this is probably the simplest version of it and also the most well-performing version of it that I've seen. Okay. Comparison. Here you have some trajectories. Uh, position tracking error. Tracking error comparison. Measure the tracking error against a state-of-the-art benchmark left as well as improved produced improvement produced by complementing action labeled RL trajectories with action-free trajectories. Okay, so I guess they're comparing a reinforcement learning policy, which Position tracking error, right? Error, that means higher is going to be worse, lower is going to be better. So R's, so this transformer-based approach seems to be working better than the reinforcement learning-based approach. Uh, their model, so here's a little more information on what they call a vanilla transformer, right? So they mention here that it's a uh, vanilla transformer, nothing special about it. And uh, it actually is quite small. So here you have a hidden size of 192 dimensions, four layers of self-attention layers in MLP. Each self-attention has four heads. Usually that's something like eight. So it's a very small little robot or little transformer. Even the context length is uh, 16. So 16 token context length, right? Which is really small. But the reason they have to do that is because they, this needs to run, right? They actually want to run this on the robot this robot might not even have a GPU on it, right? It probably only has a CPU. So they're doing inference on a CPU, which is not very good for transformer inference, right? Transformers, because they uh, are basically doing all this parallel computation inside that attention mechanism, they really benefit from a GPU. So uh, a CPU only inference that needs to run quick enough to do a real world robot demo like this, you are gonna have to make the model very small. So that's why they have this tiny uh, model size. But the fact that they can get this level of performance with such a tiny model, that's uh, impressive in its own uh, route. Okay. Evaluation, they're gonna be evaluating this using tracking error and prediction error. Tracking error measures how accurately the robot follows a specific locomotion. Prediction error is the next token prediction. Okay. Uh, I don't think this is necessarily worth going into. Here's a third simulator. So they use uh, the Mujoko simulator. Mujoko simulator was actually recently open sourced. So the Mujoko simulator, uh, very popular in academia. I used it at Google Brain. It was popular there as well. It's not great. It's a, it's you know, it's a, it's not as fully fledged as something like an Isaac sim. It's not going to be. 
as powerful as like an Unreal Engine or a Unity, right? You can use game engines as simulators and game engines have way better kind of features in terms of like lighting and textures and, and all that kind of stuff, like the visual stuff. But Mujoko has been kind of a staple for a long time now. They have added a bunch of weird stuff. They have like interesting friction. They have like uh, deformable objects, ropes, like stuff like that. So it's kind of cool. I think if you're doing little projects here and there, Mujoko is a good uh, default, especially because they open sourced it now. But sucks for these guys, right? Like, Think about these guys. Uh, to do this robotics project, they needed to uh, use Isaac Sim, right? To get the reinforcement learning policies. They needed to use the agility robotics simulator to get the model-based uh, policies or trajectories. And then now they also are using Mujoko. So th think about that. This is a robotics paper where they use three different simulators. <laughs> <laughs> so annoying which is like one of the things like i've done a lot of robotic simulation stuff and like just the overhead of like having to learn a new simulator and like the documentation for simulators always sucks as well but i guess it's just a standard pain the validation data is separated from training data and contains state action trajectories collected from the rl policy Okay, our model exhibits superior tracking to the RL controller at all turning speeds and has near perfect tracking for state line, straight line walking. Sounds good to me. Here's the phase portrait. So compared to a reinforcement learning policy, our policy features fewer irregularities and a smoother cyclic gait. So here you see the Q knee, which is like the knee joint. Rad means radians, right? So degrees is a way of measuring the angles or radians is another way of measuring angles. Uh, Q dot, so anytime you see a dot like that, it means a derivative or velocity. So this would be the position, the angular position of the knee, and this is the velocity, angular velocity of the knee. So you can see here that uh, the gait is just a repeated motion, right? A repeated cyclic motion. So here they're looking at the position of the knee, and you can see that with the uh, transformer-based controller, it's much more consistent compared to this reinforcement learning-based controller which is uh, a lot more noisy. And this is kind of what I mean when I talk about how each of the different types of control has their own kind of flavor and signature. So model-based control is based on these systems of equations, right? So it tends to look pretty smooth and clean, right? So if you look at a lot of these early Atlas uh, robot demos, which are using this model-based control, they're very smooth and clean because it knows what it wants to do. It's already calculated the physics, the mass, where it needs to, like it's already calculated all that stuff, right? Reinforcement learning based controllers are a lot more like twitchy and noisy because in reinforcement learning, you're, you're basically plugging a, a series of observations and a series of actions into a neural net and that neural net is outputting a next action, right? So any slight budge and you can end up somewhere where it hasn't been, right? So this is uh, the problem with reinforcement learning is as soon as you go off policy or as soon as you get a little bit of weirdness, you can get a lot of weirdness, right? So the, the, the controller can kind of start doing a lot of random things. So whenever you see a robot that's a kind of like, like jittery or, or moving like that, it's probably a reinforcement learning based controller. And apparently this new generation of transformer kind of sequence based trained on big data is smooth. So good to see. Uh, quantitative ours consistently outperforms the baseline RL policy this is an interesting result a baseline is what you're comparing to so in when you're doing an experiment in order to know whether you're doing something well you're going to compare it against something else and the thing that you compare it against is called the baseline so in this case they're using a reinforcement learning policy as the baseline this is an interesting result since our model was trained on next token prediction on trajectories produced by this very policy. So what they're saying is that it's better than the reinforcement learning policy, even though the reinforcement learning policy is literally part of the data. So the neural net controller, this one here, this reinforcement learning policy is part of the data. And not only is it part of the data, but it's the only part of the data that has actions, right? So all these other ones here, whether it's the internet videos and the mocap or the motion-based controllers, none of these... Uh, data sources have actions. They only have observations. So the only actions that you get, the only reference for actions that your transformer has 
is what's coming out of this reinforcement learning agent. So naively, you would say, okay, well, if this is what I train it on, I bet you they're going to look a lot like the actions from this one because this is the only one that has actions. But they're surprised and they say, actually, it's interesting because even though it's the only part of our data that had actions, somehow we get a policy that produces better actions than the reinforcement learning policy, which is why I feel like reinforcement learning is dead. And I say this as someone who has reinforcement learning papers, you know, like I've, I was a reinforcement learning Andy at one point, you know, that's what I did for pretty much my whole career. But it's like, it's just no longer the right approach. So, uh, right when I was graduating college, which was, I think here, 2014, right? This was the very end of kind of model-based control, right? And then pretty much since then, all the stuff that I did working at Amazon, working at Google, it was all using reinforcement learning, right? The jittery kind of like neural net kind of policy. And now we're finally seeing that era end. So I, I kind of got to see the end of both eras, which is kind of interesting. I got to see the end of the model-based era, and now I'm seeing the end of the reinforcement learning era, and we're now entering the kind of big data transformer era. Okay. Uh, generalize, so they get it to walk backwards with this, which is kind of cool because that's not part of the data set. Including incomplete trajectories consistently leads to better performance, which again is what you want to see. And this is what they're going to do with the scaling studies here. So they're going to try uh, scaling different parts of this. So trajectories, so try with 1,000 trajectories compared to 10,000 trajectories. So this is the size of the data set that you're training it on. And then the position tracking error goes down. So the, more, the bigger your training data, the better you perform. Uh, context length. So the context length is basically the how much of the sequence can your transformer consume? So you can basically think of this as the context length, right? So how many things do you have here? Uh, in the paper, because they want to run this on a real robot, you can only get 16 steps. So it's a, it's a small context length on the demo, but they try out in simulation longer context lengths and see, uh, you see 16 versus 32 versus 48, you're getting better performance. So bigger context, better performance, more data, better performance, and then bigger model. So this is the number of parameters, better performance. And these are really tiny. This is a 8 million parameter transformer. That's a very small transformer, right? We're not talking about like a 7 billion parameter. We're talking about an 8 million parameter transformer, which is small. Uh, they do some ablation studies, joint training, this was the kind of interesting part to me where at least it's not some complicated curriculum. You know, a lot of these, especially reinforcement learning, that's, so uh, model-based control is complicated because you have to basically come up with these systems of equations which are really annoying and then you have to solve them usually with kind of numerical methods that are noisy. So model-based control is actually the most complicated type of control in my opinion. But one of the reasons that reinforcement learning is complicated is that reinforcement learning is very sensitive to the curriculum, right? So like you have to be very careful about the type of data that you introduce and how you train it over time. And if you actually look at a lot of reinforcement learning control papers, they have very fancy curriculums, right? So right off the head, I think about these Peter Abiel like ant papers, Peter Abiel ant paper. Yeah, this is a famous robotics guy, but Okay, this is not at all what I wanted, but uh, this guy had good papers on robotics. I don't know. I won't find it. But in all of his papers, it felt like every time I saw them, there was like this, like, we first train it to stand up, and then we train it to walk forward, and then we train it to walk backwards, and then we train it to turn. So it's like, it's like a very complicated curriculum versus here. They're literally just throwing all the data into this giant bucket and just, and just feeding it into this transformer. All, and it just works better than the reinforcement learning. So again, I just love to see something that works better that's also less complex. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Let's read this uh, discussion or this conclusion section here. We present a self-supervised approach for real world humanoid locomotion, right? Self-supervised in that you don't need to uh, provide any supervision signal, which would be kind of, here's the action that you need to produce given this observation which is largely what our reinforcement learning is, right? You're saying, for example, in behavior cloning, which is a type of reinforcement learning, you're saying, here's what the expert did at this observation. Here's what the expert did at this observation, right? 
And that is a type of supervised learning because you need to know what the output is given a certain input. This is self-supervised because you don't need the action. In fact, most of the data that they train on does not have the action, right? Most of the data that they train on is just observations only. Uh, our model is trained on a collection of sensory motor trajectories, which come from prior neural network policies, the reinforcement learning ones, model-based controllers, the grandpa generation, human motion capture, and YouTube videos of humans. We show that our model enables a full-size humanoid to walk in the real world zero shot. These findings suggest that a promising path towards learning challenging real world robot control tasks by generating, by generative model modeling of large collection of trajectories. <laughs> a little bit of a tongue twister on that one, but, uh, that's what I got, guys. That's basically the paper. It's not a super long paper. It's a pretty short little paper. You know, most kind of academic papers like this are quite short. It's not like your DeepMind paper or your Llama 2 release paper that is like 70 pages long. But I love it. You know, it's, it's such a simple solution, such a clean implementation. And it represents to me kind of the nail in the coffin for reinforcement learning as a control strategy, as the dominant control strategy, and kind of the beginning of this big data into a just a big transformer and then just crank that scale and it just works so i'm excited all right let me see uh combining the four have you seen okay human observation from chef human pose is jittery so that bad behavior from neural net is actually what's realistic neurologically Kind of, I don't, I don't know, right? I'm sure that there's jittery trajectories here, right? But the jittery mocap and internet video, so like if there's trajectories here that are very jittery, I bet you that the inverse kinematic solution is not gonna be great. And they said that they filter by the inverse, uh, by the basically the final value of this inverse kinematic solve. So there's probably some filtering happening here to only keep the best videos and mocap data. So maybe that solves that. I always didn't like RL in finance and I guess somehow all the other dominant domain agreed with that law. So, okay, maybe, maybe let me let me take that back a little bit because I think there's probably some reinforcement learning people that are like yelling at their computer right now telling me that I'm stupid, but reinforcement learning is not dead in general, reinforcement learning is the only way that you're gonna to get to superhuman intelligence, right? So reinforcement learning for robotic control, specifically for robotic control of things that are very human-like, like walking or grabbing or anything like this where you basically have a huge amount of human data. I think reinforcement learning for that doesn't make sense based on this paper, right? To me, that's where reinforcement learning is dead. It's like if you already have 10 million hours of people on YouTube throwing a ball, you don't need to do a reinforcement learning uh, approach to learn how to throw the ball. But if you wanna train an AI that has superhuman chess capability, you're not gonna get that from this approach here, right? Or if you wanna train uh, AI to do some kind of superhuman like uh, finance stuff, it's not like there's a huge amount of finance data just sitting there that you can train on and then it's just going to mimic that, right? So I guess maybe the way to describe what I'm saying is that this type of approach, this kind of big data approach will only basically mimic the distribution that is already there, right? So you're only going to get something that walks like a human, but if you're trying to train a robot, that's what you want, right? You want something that walks, but if you wanted to find a new type of walking gait that was somehow more efficient than the human gait, you wouldn't get it from this. You would have to do some reinforcement learning on top of that. So just walking back a little bit, reinforcement learning is still going to be used. I'm sure 10 years from now, there will be plenty of use cases where reinforcement learning was absolutely crucial. But I just think that reinforcement learning as kind of like the default go-to, especially for robotics things where you have huge amounts of data that you could be using, such as walking and grabbing and moving in a human-like way, I think that's where reinforcement learning is not going to be super useful. Uh, since knees are not the same, what exactly are they trying to make equivalent? The trajectory of the feet? I guess, I don't actually know. They don't really tell you. 
but yeah, I assume it's probably just the inverse kinematics of the final point, which is the the foot. In mechanical machines, we need data as smooth as possible because jury motion is actually from body noises, not from intention. Yeah, there's other stuff you can add to it. So like most uh, model-based controllers have like all this extra crap on top of it, like Kalman filters, for example, is a way of kind of smoothing things out there as well. But that's kind of what I mean when I say that model-based control is like the most advanced of all of these because pretty much since like the early 1900s, it was all model-based control. So there's been decades and decades and decades of work to add all these little extra bells and whistles to improve model-based control, such as Kalman filters. But if we're already beating those types of approaches with something as naive and simple as just a vanilla transformer trained with a bunch of internet data, I think eventually this is what we're going to see. Uh, okay, we're only at 11.30, but this isn't a super long paper, so how about this? How about you guys ask some more questions? Put your questions in the chat. I'm going to drink this water, and then I'm going to summarize this paper. All right, no questions. So here's the summary. Today we reviewed a uh, recent paper uh, from Berkeley called Humanoid Locomotion as Next Token Prediction. This came out 29th of February, 2024. So in this paper, they create a motion controller for a robot, a bipedal humanoid robot that can work in the real world and that zero shots into the real world. So they didn't train this controller in the real world. This controller is trained entirely on data that they scraped from the internet and data that they scraped from simulators. So this robot has never seen the real world and they can zero shot, AKA take that control policy that they learned and then just apply it and it works in the real world, which is really impressive. So the way that they're gonna do this is that they're gonna use a very simple formulation. They're gonna use a transformer. Transformer is your everyone's favorite model architecture. It's a sequence to sequence model. It consumes a sequence of things and it outputs a sequence of things. So the sequence of things in this case is gonna be a sequence of tokens where those tokens are concatenated observations and actions. So an observation is gonna be basically all the joint angles. So the position of the knee, the position, uh, the angle of the, uh, of the ankle, uh, the, velo the angular velocity of the ankle, right? So there's some vector that has a bunch of numbers that represent the, obser or the observation of the state of the robot. And then there's gonna be an action space. The action space might be the actual uh, motor current or the position that you want for the foot or something like that, right? And depending on the robot, there's gonna be different observation spaces, different action spaces. But what they're gonna be doing is very naively just concatenating these. So they just concatenate the observation and the uh, action vector, uh, linearly project it into an embedding dimension and then get these little embedding vectors, feed that through a vanilla transformer, which is just your standard multi-head self-attention, little uh, feed forward, little layer norm, little residual connections here, and then unproject it back into an observation or back into this token and then uh, unconcatenate it back into observation and actions. So, uh, that's roughly the controller. The controller is just a transformer. Uh, they use a pretty small little transformer because they need this transformer to basically uh, be doing inference on a robot that probably doesn't have a GPU, so they need a transformer that's small enough to do fast inference on a CPU. And the more interesting part of this paper is that uh, the data that they train this on is very, very simple or not very, very simple, but the data that they train this on is just this giant mash of different types of data. So they have data coming from a neural net controller. This is data that they get from a Isaac Sim simulator, which is NVIDIA's robotic simulator, and they have a reinforcement learning policy, 
which is a neural network that has been trained using reinforcement learning. Uh, and they have whatever, 10,000 trajectories of that. Then they also have 10,000 trajectories that is coming from a model-based controller. A model-based controller is a controller that is more so a system of equations. That's what the model in a model-based controller is, is. This is the model of your robot, except it's going to be more complicated because this is just the equations of a pendulum. So imagine what the equations of a multi-linked robot look like. They're even more complicated. Uh, but you have a simulator where you can run that controller and then get a bunch of trajectories there. And then they also have a bunch of mocap and internet videos. So mocap is basically someone sits in one of those like black skin tight suits with the little like ping pong balls and they like run around in, in, in like a little room. That's what mocap is. Uh, those are gonna give you a bunch of trajectories and the internet videos are just YouTube videos of people walking that they run a pose detection model on so that they can get basically the pose. For these two sources here, which are the human sources, they're not quite the same observation and action space as this robot, right? It's not the same action space. It's not the same observation space. So what they're going to do is they're going to basically retarget using inverse kinematics. Inverse kinematics is uh, a your base is the opposite of forward kinematics. And what inverse kinematics is is trying to find the angles that give you a uh, put your knee in a certain place or put your foot in a certain place or put your hand in a certain place, right? So it's kind of a way of getting what would be the joint angles of your robot to end up with the feet in the same place or the hands in the same place. I don't know, I don't know some combination of the hands or the hips or the head or something like that, right? They don't actually really tell you uh, the specific details of the observation in the action space. But they just take all this and Note that some of these don't even have actions. So model-based controller, mocap, and internet videos don't have the same action space, and you don't even know what the actions are for these two. So in order to train on this, they're going to have to basically use masked tokens. So they create a masked token, M, and whenever they don't have the action, they're just going to have a trajectory that is observation, mass token, observation, mass token, observation, mass token. So the majority of their data set doesn't even have actions. It's only observations. The only actions they have are coming from this reinforcement learning controller. And they just feed all of that data into this transformer in no specific order. So there's no fancy curriculum stuff going here where they, they first they do a stand up and then they do the walking forward and then they do turning. So there's no fancy order of operations here. They just mash all that data through the transformer and ultimately, they end up with a basically state-of-the-art controller. Now, granted, this is a pretty simple little problem, right? You're just walking forward. That's the simplest type of robotic control problem. It's not like you're doing multi-hand finger manipulation. You know, that's a much more difficult control problem. If they got state-of-the-art for that, I would be ridiculously impressed. So, you know, getting kind of state-of-the-art walking controller is like, yeah, okay, that's cute. But... I think it's important. And the reason I think it's important is because to me, this paper uh, represents the beginning of kind of a new era, right? It, it show maybe not this paper specifically, but this paper combined with the robotic transformer papers from Google, to me, what it's showing us is that we've now entered the era of kind of big data through a transformer as a control policy. And uh, for context, the way that most people did robotics in the 1900s all the way up to like the early 2010s which is actually when i went to school was with model-based control and model-based control is very complicated very intense and it's what uh for example the atlas or the boston dynamics robots use and we actually even learned that it's what the agility these robots use the uh, model-based control as well and the reason people like it is because it's very predictable you know exactly what the model is doing right so people often complain that neural networks are a black box right i can't look at the activations of a multi-layer perceptron and tell you what the fuck is going on. But I can look at the uh, angles and the different uh, values for the different equations inside my model-based control and I can tell you what's going on. So there's a reason they've been very popular, this model-based control. But right around the kind of 2010s, people started to uh, fall in love with something else. They started to fall in love with these deep reinforcement learning based uh, control policies. And deep reinforcement learning, now we're finally using a neural net, but the way that we're learning it 
is very fragile, right? So we're doing things like behavior cloning. We're basically learning this, this almost like uh, lizard brain kind of like, here's what, here's what the state is, here's what the action is, and it just lizard brain outputs the next action, right? And deep reinforcement learning and reinforcement learning based controllers never quite got good enough, right? We didn't quite get the robots in 2015. And it's just a little bit noisy, like they, they're too fragile, they're too sensitive. If you go outside of the training distribution, they kind of quickly just explode, right? So if you only collected data in a certain type of regime, as soon as you go outside of that regime, the re these reinforcement learning controllers just explode. And then also they started to get very complicated, right? With these different curriculums, like multiple different parts. It started to get really intense. And finally we have uh, an answer from the heavens. It turns out that I think that the way that we're gonna be controlling robots in the future is with a very simple transformer that just you trained on a huge amount of data where that data doesn't even necessarily need to be super clean. It doesn't need to be complete. It doesn't need to even have the same action space. So that's where we're headed. You know, somehow magically we ended up at a place where the answer that we're going to be using going forward is simpler than all the things that people did before, which is good because I feel like you know, we're kind of becoming more and more stupid as humans, so it's good that the engineering is getting easier rather than harder. Uh, and that's basically it, guys. I kind of did a little rundown on some of the other humanoids here, so feel free to go to the earlier parts of the video if you're interested in kind of looking at the other humanoids. I think there's a lot of different companies in this now. Obviously, they're not all going to survive. I think we're kind of in a bubble right now. We're humanoid bubble. If I had to bet... I feel like it's going to be the Tesla robot just because the Tesla Tesla as a company, just Elon has so much money and he's so good at making things, you know, like that experience of making cars at a high volume is very, very difficult. Like high volume, like manufacturing like that, extremely difficult. So I actually think that these guys are going to fall flat on their face. This robot looks very fragile. It just looks like a research prototype. Look at all these exposed cables. Look at all this machined aluminum on here. This just... It looks terrible. I think that they're even going to get beat by these robots, right? Imagine if you're OpenAI and you're partnering with Figure, right? And OpenAI is like, all right, we have GPT-7 now. We can basically zero shot anything you want. And Figure's like, all right, here, we're going to give you 10 robots and uh, they're each going to be a million dollars. And OpenAI is like, uh, actually, we want a thousand robots, and then OpenAI is going to go on the internet. They're going to type cheap humanoid robots. They're going to land on this website. And this Chinese company is going to be like, hey, we can give you uh, 10,000 robots for $10,000 a pop. And then Sam Altman's going to be like, fuck these guys. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not paying these guys a million dollars a robot and they can only give me 10. And if I want 100, I'm going to have to wait another year. So I don't know. That's my spicy take on where the humanoid robot space is going. But... Uh, did you buy Tesla stock? I own some Tesla stock, but not, I'm not, I wouldn't buy any stock right now. Everything is kind of overvalued. Uh, question from Majetti. Do you see a value in hybrid architectures given they require less training data to get comparable results? Yeah, I think something like a Mamba or a recurrent neural network will probably work better because Mambas are also very fast. So, you know, because they're a states kind of like a state space model, you can you don't need as much compute, right? You don't need to be doing this attention map, which is the worst part of the transformer. You can just basically have this little hidden state, and it's a lot faster to do inference with a Mamba model. So, especially in maybe not walking, because walking is pretty simple, but something like fine hand manipulation, right? Imagine in in walking, you're action and state space are quite small actually because you only have ankles and hips and joints like whenever you go into manipulation now think about that you have 10 legs so your your action space is so much bigger that if you have a transformer where you're doing this attention mechanism that's kind of exploding the amount of computation you need to do so it could i could definitely see that where we end up seeing these kind of uh rnn like models such as mamba that become more popular for this Uh, my lab doesn't even have the first prototype. <laughs> no worries, man. 
Okay. Uh, I'm planning on doing a PhD in this space. Going to start master's this year. Any tips on what I should focus on in my research and thesis? I don't know. Maybe maybe do what uh, Majetti suggested. Take this paper and then just basically implement the same paper, but then sub out this transformer for a Mamba and see if it works better. That's a little easy, easy little thing there. Okay, I think that's all the questions. But hope you guys found that interesting. Uh, tune in next week for more exciting papers, or maybe we'll already be at the uh, AGI Utopia at that point. I don't know. We'll see. I feel like the GPT-5 is, has to come out soon, right? But thanks, Hamza. Thanks, Chef, Ed, Joseph, Beck, Majetti, MWD87GN, Aries, Ruslan, Emily, Joseph, Sakun, uh, Beck, more Ruslan, Khalil, SHZ, Aries, Sagar, Isaac, the Yivian, and Rumpel Stils Chen. Thanks for the chat. Thanks for the watch. See you guys later, and hope you guys have a great weekend.